starting where we left off last class period. After the second exam, we had a brief period of time where we studied the hydrogen atom. And so we had to take what we learned in the previous sections and now apply it to our first real practical problem. Simple harmonic oscillator is, a, is reasonably practical. Simple harmonic oscillator, the um, energies of bonds can be approximated simple harmonic oscillators. So it's all right, a quantum harmonic oscillator, I should say. So, so that does have its place, but the hydrogen atom is really the grand thing we look for in an introductory quantum physics class. So the first thing we had to do is we've been working in one dimension. Now, there's a lot of three-dimensional transitional problems we didn't do. Um, you know, things like three-dimensional um, quantum oscillator. It's, it's not a horrible, hard problem. In fact, it's a pretty easy problem, but we didn't do it. So clearly, I'm not asking you about that. But we had to get our Laplacian, right, because momentum, <laughs> all my colors are screwed up because I was using a bad color. Come on. I was using a bad color this morning, so I had to change some colors. So we had momentum is equal to minus I H bar. And if I do D momentum in the X direction, it's minus I H bar D D X. And likewise for Y and Z. So you put those together and you have the momentum vector is equal to minus I H bar and then gradient. I, I say the gradient, I say Laplace, I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing it all right or wrong. Um, so since the Hamiltonian, P squared over 2M plus V, is your Hamiltonian, then we have P squared is minus h bar squared del squared. And so we have to get del squared. And because of the spherical symmetry for the potential energy function, we are going to want to use the spherical coordinates. And you, you indicated, I think, last class period that you're really comfortable with that because of electricity and magnetism at this point. Yeah. Um, but that's the first step is we had to get our um, Laplacian in into the coordinates that are going to work with the symmetry we have. Right. And so then we separated variables, and the separation of variables was more complicated. So I'm not going to have you do the problem, right? That's untractable for a test. But the first thing you do is you say, ah, when I do this Laplacian, I have one part that only has um, R as a variable, either derivative with respect to R or the potential energy function that's a function of R. And then I have another portion that is a function of both the angle theta and the angle phi. And so that means I should be able to separate into an R solution and a theta phi solution. And so we separate it and we said it's equal to a constant which we randomly chose would be L times L plus one, just for no good reason. Yeah. And then we, we set aside the radial solution, said we've got that in our back pocket. Let's stay with the angles. And then looking at the angular equation, we found that we could further separate it into a portion that was just dependent on the azimuthal angle and one that was just dependent on the altitude angle. And so we separate them again and set them for random reasons equal to M. Then the math got hard. Then we're like, how do we find a solution to this? Now, the, the azimuthal one was actually super easy because you just had, you know, derivative of a function is equal to an angle, well, yeah, is equal to a constant. You integrate that up and you got e to the im phi as your solution. That, that was easy. But for the other part, the theta part, it took a lot of work. I am not going to require you to redo that work. Just it took a lot of work. And we found a solution for theta. And then we put the two together and we get our spherical harmonics. 
So we get our spherical harmonics. I think it's Y sub LM superscript M. I may have my notation there incorrect, but I think that's right. I think that's right, yeah. So we have our spherical harmonics, and those spherical harmonics are the solution to any central force problem. Any problem where you have a, a spherically symmetric potential energy function is going to have those spherical harmonics as its solution for the um, angular part. So that's why when we were looking at a homework problem and it just said, you know, angular momentum squared, well, it turns out that angular momentum squared operating on psi LM M gives you H bar squared L times L plus one. And usually they put, you know, ML in there instead of psi LM M. So the solutions to the angular momentum squared operator are your spherical harmonics. And thus, that homework problem you're able to jump right to, I know what the solutions are. And I am not going to hold your feet to the fire on knowing what the associated Legendre function is or the Legendre polynomials. Those are steps along the way in solving the problem. They're steps you have to see to know they exist and to be able to refer to them. But in my opinion, you don't have to be able to reinvent the wheel. You just have to be able to follow along for something like this. Hopefully, Dr. Lang doesn't disagree. Uh, if you want us to build like the spherical harmonic, would you give us like an L and M and then like a, uh, a table of conjugal numbers to build it? Like, for certain um, yes, if I was going to have you build one, I would give you those. Yes. Okay. Because I don't expect you to have it memorized. And I certainly don't expect that you're going to derive it again. So we have those solutions, the two quantum numbers. And built into these solutions, we were able to show by looking at the associated Legendre function and the equation for the Legendre polynomials that we had to have the, the restriction that minus m less than or equal to L is less than or equal to M. That is, my M values, actually, I should have written it the other way. I should have written it this way. That's because it's M that the one the restriction is on. M is between plus L and minus L. So if L is 3, M could be 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. That came out of the math required to find these solutions. So, you know, we've talked about it with the picture, you know, looking at the total angular momentum and the orientation and shown that, hey, it's impossible to have the angular momentum in the Z direction bigger than the total angular momentum. So that sets the same restriction. But we had a mathematical restriction actually first. Before we identified even what these things meant, we had the mathematical restriction. Then we go to the radial solution and... In the radial solution, we did the large radius solution first to make sure that it's going to be something that we can find an inner product of. Then we did the small radius solution and said, once again, it can't blow up, and found the small radius solution. Then we said, well, the total solution should be the product of the large radius solution times the small radius solution times some... Fourier function. And then after making that infinite function, we realized, well, if this is truly an infinite function, it's going to not be normalized at large radius. This is going to be bigger than my large radius function goes to zero. So we set the restriction that it has to terminate. It doesn't matter if it terminates at the two billionth term. If it terminates, then our large radius solution is going to dominate at large enough radius. If it doesn't terminate, is the only time we have a problem. And so then we said, well, we have a recursive relation for the um, coefficients in our polynomial. 
And that cursive relationship only had one fundamental value everything was built from, right? The, the A sub zero, if you will. And then everything else was A sub one is equal to A sub zero and this other stuff. So if there is a terminating level, then everyone beyond there is going to be zero by the definition of our recursive function. And so we set that limit that N told us what the maximum number of terms was in our polynomial. And I, I think it was um, N is equal to J plus one or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, but it, it tells us the number of terms in our polynomial. And then we found that it's required that N is greater than L. So that means we get, we'd have N is greater than L, which is greater than or equal to zero, which set a limit on the angle momentum we can have for different ends. All of this was purely mathematical. The only quantum physics was the starting point. And then it was all mathematical. We weren't talking about, so what does this mean? We were just, what math can we do? And so we get to this end and we have rules for these quantum numbers and further rules with it were that n is an integer and m is an integer and l is an integer. Those were further rules that, that came mathematically. So we have these quantum numbers and then we started looking at, so what does it all mean? Because doing math is one thing, having meaning to the math, making it useful, that's a different thing. And so then we came back and we looked and we said, okay, so what, what do we get when we do the angular momentum operator with the angular momentum in Z, for instance? And we found, well, first of all, those don't commute. So we can't simultaneously know the angular momentum and the orientation of the angular momentum. So then we considered, what about if we did L squared? And what you find is L squared commutes with L sub Z. So we can know L squared and L sub Z simultaneously. Now, we also had L sub Z and L sub X, and you replace X with Y. That was also not zero. What does it mean if L sub X and L sub Z doesn't commute? Well, you can't know them at the same time. Right. That, that's what I was looking for. You can't know at the same time, and there's going to be uncertainty relation. So we just arbitrarily choose. We can only know one of the orientation values and the angular momentum squared. So we just arbitrarily say we're going to choose Z and we're defining the Z direction as the direction of our external applied magnetic field. So there's the arbitrary choices. And then we made raising and lowering operators and found that the raising and lowering operators affected the L value but not the uh, M value. Um, no, I said that backward. Uh oh, yeah, they affect the M value, but not the L value. I said it backward. So the raising and lowering are going to change the orientation of the angle momentum, but not the total angle momentum. And so we then were able to say, okay, so what's L squared op operating on? And now I'm going to put NLM because those are the three quantum numbers we had. And we found, hey, that's equal to h bar squared L times L plus 1. How convenient that we had chosen that for the constant. And so that told us that this is our total angle momentum squared. And likewise... that. So it was from putting the operators on the functions that we actually find out, oh, L is telling me about the total angular momentum. M is telling, about me, uh, telling me about the orientation of the angular momentum. It's not until we put the operators on there that we find out that these randomly chosen constants have significant meaning. And it is very convenient that h bar is simply our unit of angular momentum. 
So the orientation, the Z direction is, you know, one H bar, two H bar, three H bar. Couldn't be much easier than that. The total angle momentum is, okay, it's a little bit harder. Square root of zero H bar, square root of two H bar, square root of six H bar. It's a little more complicated, but it's still pretty simple. Yeah. So now we have meaning to what those quantum numbers give us. They relate now to observables that are useful to us. And then we have, well, where did we start this whole thing? The Hamiltonian acting on NLM should equal the energy times NLM. And so when we did that, we found a complicated formula, which is summarized as E sub 1 over N squared NLM. So that tells us, ah, N is telling us about the energy. So now we can identify based on putting the operators acting on our wave function that N tells us the energy. Before, N just told us which term it terminated on in the polynomial. But now all of a sudden, hey, but that tells us the energy as well. And L tells us the angular momentum, M sub L, the orientation. Now they have physical meanings. Something we did not get to is the real hydrogen atom. This is, if you will, the general physics version of the hydrogen atom. In general physics, we said, let's assume there's no air resistance. Yep. It's very demonstrable that that's not true. Our cars don't get, you know, infinite gas mileage on the freeway. Right? Because right? in theory, if there was no air resistance and if there's no rolling um, friction, once you get up to 60 miles an hour, you just shift her into neutral and just steer. Yeah. yeah. But no, there's air resistance. Our, our, our general physics approximation is nowhere close. Well, we made a bunch of approximations with the hydrogen atom that you may or may not recognize. And you may have had these covered in other classes. But I want to make sure I at least mention them before we go on. What approximations did we make? <laughs> Those two came really close together. Yeah. <laughs> what approximations did we make? And I don't think at any time I said, let's make this approximation. We just said, yeah, that makes sense. One of the first ones we made is that the nucleus is stationary. It's not stationary. We have, just like the sun and the earth are together orbiting the Berry center, the center of mass between them, the electron the nucleus will be orbiting the Berry center between the electron nucleus, which is not exactly the center of the nucleus. Right. And so that's going to change all of our numbers by a very small amount. So we make a correction to this. Use, use reduced mass. If you use the reduced mass instead of the actual mass of the electron, and remember we had re reduced mass is equal to mass of the proton, mass of the electron over the mass of the proton plus the mass of the electron. Since the mass of the electron is really small compared to the proton, that's very close to just mass proton over mass proton times mass of electron, but it's not exactly equal. So when we do corrections, that's our first correction we make is let's correct to the right mass. If we connect to that, connect to that, then we've taken away the assumption that the nucleus is stationary. Okay. Number two, and I don't know, there's usually an order to the way these are introduced, but since we're not actually going to do the corrections, the order doesn't really matter. We assume that the electron was moving at non-relativistic speeds. So the next correction is
And I'm just going to put connect for relativity. Honestly, I don't remember exactly what that correction is. So you have to correct for the speed because the electron is moving pretty quick in the hydrogen atom. Right, you can use the Bohr model and calculate what the speed is according to the Bohr model. Another approximation. Well, that the electron's magnetic moment, its spin, doesn't interact with the orbital angular momentum. Because you have the orbital angular momentum, you have a magnetic moment created by the electron orbiting. But you have also the electron's magnetic moment, its spin, and so you have a higher energy when they're anti-aligned than when they're aligned. So that's an energy difference, and so that correction is called the spin-orbit coupling. you make a correction for the energy shift. That's the fine, um, I'm gonna say fine spectrum. I hope that's the right words. One of the things that was a failure of the Bohr model was it couldn't explain this fine spectra, the fact that a line would split if you looked at it really carefully. And it splits because the electron can be aligned with or against the angular momentum. And then the final one the nucleus's magnetic moment doesn't interact with the spin. It does. And so that brings us to the spin spin coupling. So these are all corrections that we make to the solution we've already found. So you start with the solution we did. You don't scrap it and start over from scratch. You start with that and then you say, well, the Hamiltonian should be adjusted by this. And then you use the solutions we already found to see how that's going to adjust the eigenvalues and the eigenstate. And so that's called perturbation theory. We're not doing that. I just want you to know what we have found is the legitimate starting point for a hydrogen atom, but it's not the legitimate end for the hydrogen atom. And of course, if you go to two electrons, things get more complicated because then you have to worry about the interaction between the two electrons as well. Okay, so that's, that's something we didn't talk about. I'm not going to have that on the test, but I want you to at least have that knowledge. Something so that when, when Blake starts in next semester, he's probably going to start in somewhere close to right there. So it's not just a shock. <laughs> what? I thought we had it solved. Okay, so the quantum numbers... The, um, oh, what made me think about this and going through it is it turns out that when you include these things here, that you're going to have L and M contribute to the energy. So the first order approximation was that only N was telling you about the energy. But when you go realistic, the L and M's also play into it. And I can't remember the ins and outs of it because I haven't prepared for it this semester. But it, it's actually really interesting 
because you see that as you go through the corrections, this correction makes things split. And then this one actually makes things come back together. It's kind of surprising. So you'll do that next semester, I'm sure. I was, just so you know, the pace at which I'm teaching is different than what I usually teach. But that's because what I usually teach is four lectures a week rather than three. And so we get further into it and we don't have a second semester. You have two semesters, so you just have three and three. You're in the in the long run going to get, you know, 50% more, but it's split differently. So that's why that's usually in my class. I say usually. We're going to shift it to always being like this, but pass. So those quantum numbers now, we've talked about what they mean, spectroscopic notation, because, well, it's a useful way of abbreviating things. And so we use capital letters KLM to indicate the N value. We call that the shell. So K tells us the shell, the principal, or N tells us the shell, the principal quantum number. And if it's a capital K shell, that means N is 1. So when you put K, that means N is 1. So if you have like x-ray spectrum k alpha the k means you're going to end at n equals one if you have l alpha it means you're going to end at n equals two that have you seen that notation for x-rays yeah so you know what the alpha and beta mean yeah and then we have the l values with the interesting SPDF or sharp principle diffuse fundamental. And those come from people's observation of spectral lines and saying, ooh, if you have L equals zero, it's really, you know, a sharp peak that you can define. And the um, the D was it's if it's in a D orbital, it's diffuse. The line is more spread out. So that's where the, those things come from. And I don't know how principle and fundamental come from. I just know those two. <laughs> But they, they come from people's observation of the spectral lines. And so the L values, we just substitute a letter for L equals 1, 2, 3. The reason for doing this is you don't say it's in the 3, 1, 0 state. You say it's in the K, S, you know, and, and it's, it's more distinct. You're not repeating the same thing. And omitting J, which I had thought it was I initially, just get that out. And then M sub L, it's the orientation of the angular momentum, it's the magnetic. We write it as M for magnetic and L because it's the one that L has to do with. So any, any quantum number with M means that it's something that we see its effects in a magnetic field. And then the subscript is telling us which aspect we're seeing the effects from. So M sub L means it's due to the, ang the orbital angular momentum. And then it's implied, oh, it's orientation. M sub S due to the spin angular moment or spin magnetic moment. And so here's the math to go with our fundamental energy, our angular momentum, and our Z component of angular momentum. I've already written out all of these except for this one here. I just put E for everything in parentheses. Go ahead. Yeah, E1. Yeah. And then we had spin states. So the spin states is what we've had since the last lectures, or not last lecture, since the last test, right? Or did we have spins before the last test? I don't think we did. I don't think so. Yeah. So spin states, first we had the interesting result that there is a magnetic moment for electrons and it can't be because they're spinning because it just made intuitive sense that they were spinning is what was causing it but now we find out they don't we find out that every single electron has exactly the same angular momentum or intrinsic magnetic moment see i said the wrong word because we tie them together and so every single electron has s equal to one half so does every single proton so does every single neutron. They all are spin one half particles, which means that the angular momentum squared, and we use a capital S, so this is lowercase. And this is <laughs> the spin angular momentum
So that's exactly the same equation as we had for the total angular momentum from the um, L value. Right. And since every single electron has the same spin, you get the same number for this. We never talk about this because it's the same for every electron. What's the point in repeating the calculation 50 times if it's every time going to be the same? So we only do it once or twice in lecture and then once in review. So the, the total angular momentum for any fermion is always h bar square root of 3 over 4. So we never talk about it. It's not one of the quantum numbers we use to describe the atom because it's the same for everything. It's, it would be ridiculous to say, oh, and remember, s is equal to 1 half. Instead, we focus then on the orientation of the spin. So if you talk to a a chemistry student, they're going to be looking at you cross-eyed when I say we never talk about the spin. They're like, we always talk about the spin. You have spin up, spin down. Well, no, that's the M sub S. So just like before, you have minus S is less than or equal to M sub S is less than or equal to S. And you can only shift by integers. <clears throat> so in this case, your M sub S has two values. one half and minus one half and so we tend to call those up and down for the orientations why up and down it's easy opposites and then we can talk about the angular momentum in the z direction is equal to m sub s h bar and we calculate the angular momentum in the z direction or the spin in the z direction if you want to be accurate Now, because spin is an intrinsic property, unlike all the work we've done before, we can't define a wave function associated with spin. It doesn't exist. But that doesn't mean we can't make a vector for it. So we make a vector, and we just start with, well, our spin states. We can have M sub, um, S sub Z has the states of H bar, one half, zero, zero, minus one half. And we say the solutions to this matrix are gonna be my spin states. Now it's already diagonalized because I already knew my eigenvalues. Why would I choose something crazy when I already know the eigenvalues? Just make it diagonalized with the eigenvalues on the diagonals. And when it's diagonalized, you don't have to do work. You don't have to show me on the test how to find the eigenvalues if it's diagonalized. You can say, don't put the quotes. I'm saying that because you can say it. You are familiar with the term trace elements, right? In respect, yeah. to a in, in respect to a matrix, the trace is the diagonal line. So the trace elements are the elements on the diagonal. So in this case, it's h bar over 2 and minus h bar over 2. Okay. So you don't have to put the quotations. I'm putting that because I'm saying you could say that. But you can just say, we can read it. There's no calculation necessary. I know you have enough linear algebra to be able to do that step. And so this gives us eigenvalues. I mean, I built it knowing what the eigenvalues are. And then the eigenstates, once again, if it's diagonalized, you don't have to do the work to find the eigenstates. If it's diagonalized, then your states are 1, 0, and 0, 1. A negative one works too. It's still orthogonal and normalized. It could be zero and I if you wanted. Yeah. It still has the right properties. But yeah. 
why make life hard? Because right. <laughs> I, I can. <laughs> Um, there were also raising and lowering operators, the, the exact same definition for the raising and lowering operators that we use in angle momentum we used with spin. So we have all of the matrix methods that we use with angle momentum come into play again here. Now, you know what we didn't do? Again, something that I normally do do is we didn't spend a lot of time with the matrices for angle momentum. But we could have taken the eigenvalues that we have for um, angular momentum and made those into matrices. And, you know, so often we'll make a matrix for the L plus operator, a matrix for the L minus operator. Heck. Yeah, we are, <laughs> we're, I think one slide away from the end. Let's just look at that. So once again, in case Blake pulls that out is now you've done this, right? You can say, well, the last day of class, he did show me that. Um, so on page, where is it? What, what I'm looking for is there where we have what L plus acting on. Okay. The solution in problem 418 on page 166. I wrote it a little bit differently, but that's the equation there. Right, I just, instead of putting F, I put the cat there. Where A sub L superscript M is equal to <laughs> H bar square root of L minus plus M times L plus minus M plus one. Duh. So now we can actually make a matrix for the L plus and minus operators. That is, if I have the plus operator, so let's do the L plus. If I do I'm taking away the comma because it looks like a subscript. If I do that, that's going to be equal to my matrix element. Um, can't use A. I'm going to call my matrix capital M. M sub 2, 1. Right, it's going to tell me what the element is with 2 on that side and 1 on that side. And so if I do this, I should put this out front. When I apply the operator, it's going to raise the M by one since I use the raising operator. And so this here, of course, I did it for the same L, so I'm not going to use L. They both have the same L. Is that. So that means it's zero unless M1 is one less than M2. 
So it's going to give me diagonal, but off by one. So if I make my matrix, I'm going to have zeros down the center. And then, and I would have to think about my linear algebra a little longer to make sure I put this in the right place. So I may be going on the wrong side of that, but I would have like, and so on down on one side and everything else is zeros. And actually, yeah, it's bad that I didn't do this beforehand and pay attention to which side it would have to be, <laughs> but I didn't. So I'm not going to spend the rest of the class period figuring out which way it goes. But you can make a matrix for this. Now, this is a matrix that goes on forever. Part of the reason we tend to not do this, but you can make the lowering matrix and the raising matrix, which are going to be the same except for ones below the, the trace and ones one above the trace for the ones that aren't zeros. Um, so you can make those raising and lowering matrices, and then you can find your, um, your L squared matrix and find your eigenstates. You can do the whole nine yards for the angular momentum operators. We've done all of that process. Well, yeah, we did because we rate, we made the raising and lowering operators as two by two matrices. So we did all of that with the spin. We often illustrate it with this to show, hey, this is how it works. And it's kind of complicated when you have lots of these things. So that's why we use the other formalism, the wave formalism. But if you only have two states like the spin, well, it's real simple. Use the matrix method. Okay, I guess there were two slides left. Combining spins. Combining spins isn't as simple as it seems because when you talk about the spin, the spin is always the magnitude. And when you combine the spins, you can have them combine either parallel or anti-parallel. And if you have them both up, then the total spin would be one half plus one half is one. If they're both down, it's going to be, again, one half plus one half because they're the same direction. I used a plus sign. And so this is going to have a spin equal one, and this one has a spin equal one. Those have to be true. Right. But when they're opposite, it turns out that I have two states that are indistinguishable. Right? If, if you look at them... Whoops, genius. <laughs> Once again, I wrote them in the wrong order. So here's the typical way of writing it. But these two here, we make linear combinations and we have either, and I'm going to go with our knowledge The symmetric solution turns out to have a spin of one, and the anti-symmetric solution has a spin of zero. The way we actually established this was by just using the raising operator on this state or the lowering operator on this state. And whatever we get when we do that, it's going to have to be the spin one, M sub spin is zero state. So that's how we actually identified, oh, it's going to be the symmetric one is the spin one. So when we do this, notice there were four possible configurations, but two of them gave us M sub S equals zero. And so we were able to differentiate those two states by, by identifying one of them has a total spin of one and is in M sub S is zero. The other one is the only state for M sub S is zero. Or for, excuse me, for S is zero, for total spin of zero. And then we had the terminology of triplet because the S sub one has one, two, 
three states, it's a triplet state. So it's a triplet state because it's the same total spin with three different orientations. Whereas the singlet state only had one lonely state. So that's the singlet and triplet. It's not some crazy sounding thing. It's just there's three of them or there's one of them. And you have three because you have a spin of one. And uh, the triplet state, that third state can be either an antisymmetric or symmetric? No. The triplet state has to be the symmetric one. Right. So we have two M sub S is zero states. One of them goes with the triplet, the one that's symmetric. One of them goes with the singlet, the one that's anti-symmetric. Okay. And we actually identified that once again, simply by using the raising operator on, on this state here. Or the lowering operator on this state here. Either way, it gives you the triplet state for SE, or for M sub S is zero. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, finish that slide. We ran out of time, and now we have the, the last slide before I had the exam, which we just had anyway. So make sure you know the difference between a boson and a fermion. Um, the bosons are defined with integer spins and symmetric wave functions. Fermions are half integer spins and anti-symmetric wave functions. And only the fermions have to obey, obey the Pauli exclusion principle because the anti-symmetric state is zero if you have two particles in the same state. Because if you exchange those two particles, you have the same state. There's a minus sign, so it's going to be zero. Mm -hmm. All right. It's been good knowing you, Indy. Good luck in the final. Um, if you guys want to get together, you know, online to study, just contact me okay. and we'll work it out. Okay. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, you said earlier that the, uh, the that we couldn't find a wave function for the spin because it's intrinsic. Does that mean it's not observable? Um, no, the spin is observable. Well. The energy shifts due to the spin is, is observable, hence we consider it a, a observable. But there is not a function that can be used to describe what's going on because there is nothing going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yes, sir.